I think there's probably a more important <coughs> theme in the entire Bible than what we've been singing about, and that is the grace of God. And grace is proclaimed throughout the Bible and is ultimately revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. The last verse in the entire Bible kind of summarizes the theme. Uh, Revelation 22, 21 says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And so that which begins and starts with grace from the foundation of the world ends from the last verses of the New Testament. Paul calls it, calls it the gospel of the grace of God. He also talks about the word of his grace. The word is used 170 times in the epistles, only four times in the uh, gospels actually, but 170 times in the epistles. It's a word that Paul loved to use. Um, in fact, if I remember correctly, I think all of the epistles with regards to, uh, with exception of, I think, Hebrews, uh, begins with some salutation about the grace of God. Uh, it's one of the most important doctrinal themes in the entire Bible. And uh, some of the great theologians over the years have commented on grace. J. Gresham Machen, who is a, a particularly talented theologian, said that the center and core of the whole Bible is the doctrine of the grace of God. And so we're going to explore the grace of God a little bit for the next couple of Sundays. And the reason I'm doing it is this. Why is it important to talk about grace? Well, because every Christian needs to clearly understand what it is, and where it comes from, and what it does. Uh, also because there's such, such a lack of grace in the world today. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, ungracious behavior that goes on between people. We live in a world that's consumed with uh, earning, with uh, accumulating, uh, we use words like deserve, we use words like entitled, and all of that. And uh, it's interesting because none of these things have got to do have anything to do with grace at all. Uh, because there's also a lack of grace in the church. I'm talking about the church of Jesus in, in general. There's a lot of judgmentalism that goes on, a lot of legalism that goes on. Uh, judgmentalism kills a church. Uh, legalism kills a church. And grace keeps us alive, keeps us going. And another reason I want to share these messages is because grace is the antidote uh, when we're dealing with sin and suffering and brokenness. That's why everyone needs to hear about grace. They need to know what it is, what it does, where it comes from, and what we're supposed to do with it when it's offered to us. So we're going to define that over the next few weeks. We're going to talk about what grace does. We're going to talk about all the different kinds of grace that comes from God. Uh, and we're going to talk about how we receive grace and how we manifest grace to other people. Because that's our calling as Christians. A lot of people have tried to uh, define what grace is. Uh, some have used the acrostic, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's one way of looking at it. God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, some people call it unmerited favor. Here's a few more definitions from B.B. Uh, Warfield. Grace is free, sovereign favor to the ill-deserving. Uh, John Stott said, grace is love that cares and stoops and rescues. And someone else said, grace is God reaching downward to people who are in, who are in rebellion against him. So here's some things I want to start this whole thing so that we begin to build an understanding of grace. Um, you would think the way Paul uses it in his epistles he's been almost flippant when he talks about grace and peace to you, grace and peace, grace and peace. But he's not. He's not just saying words. He's really asking God to show grace and to give peace to his listeners, to those people, those churches that he had planted for the most part that he was wanting to bless uh, with the ministry of the gospel. And so here's some things about grace that I put together that I think is a good start for us to understand. First of all, grace is from God and is about God. Although we are recipients of the grace of God, grace does not begin in us. It begins somewhere else. Grace is a description of part of the nature and character of God. He is the God of grace. Now, he has many, many attributes. Holiness and righteousness, omnipotence, omniscience, uh, 
developed all well for all seeing, and you could go on and on and on, but grace is one of those attributes of God that have to do with us because he gives his grace to us uh, under certain conditions. Ephesians chapter 1 that I read said this, and then we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. Now when you read that verse there, the one thing it really sticks out is that God is not skimpy with his grace. It talks about the riches of his grace which he has and what is lavished upon us. I got some lavishing uh, a week ago or so uh, for my birthday when I went to uh, the spa in it was Rochester and got my massage and the hot tub and all that kind of good stuff. A lot of pampering going on there, uh, lavishing. Uh, and that's kind of what was going over the score. It was like, all I needed was a 45 minute massage and she bought me a 90 minute one, which was great. So that's like lavishing, going above and beyond. And that's what that verse is saying. When God engages us with his grace, he's not skimpy. He goes over the top with his grace. That's good to know. But grace is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Not just a, it, it, Sometimes we think of grace as like being a commodity. Well, grace, in a sense, is, but also is manifest in Christ. Um, John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, John 1.14, 1, should say, says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It goes on to say that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Paul then tells us in Titus 2.11 that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Now what does that mean? It simply means that grace was personified in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ himself. Uh, Michael Hawk, one of my favorite authors, says this, in grace God gives nothing less than himself. Grace is not a third thing or a substance mediating between God and sinners, but it's Jesus Christ in redeeming action. Grace personified in the one who is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Second thing I want to say is this, grace is, is the exact opposite of karma. I was thinking about that the other day, you know, people talk about that, sometimes use language to describe karma, probably have the phrase. But what I'm saying is this, karma is somebody getting what they deserve. You know, so somebody goes out there and, and steals something, right? And, 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 and when something bad happens to the person who stole something, they get stolen, stuff stolen from them, then people say, well that's karma, you know, what goes around comes around, right? But grace is the exact opposite of that, because grace is us getting what we absolutely don't deserve. Absolutely don't deserve. Grace is getting not only what we don't deserve, but keeping us from what we do deserve. So what do we deserve? Well, the Bible is very clear about that. And it's the word called justice. So since the fall of man, if we were to say to God, God, give me, you know, you know, you need to give me what I deserve. You ever seen those adverts on TV? You know, you can have the credit rating you deserve. Everybody gets all excited about that, but listen to what it's saying. Because if you get your terrible pain, your bills and the default and this and that, then guess what the credit you deserve is going to look like, right? But the problem is, don't ever say to God, you better give me what I deserve. It's not a good thing to say to God, because what we deserve is justice. Because God is a God of justice, as well as a God of love. And he holds these in equality. So grace is the opposite of karma. The biggest thing I want us to realize as we just start this thing this morning is that grace is a gift. So I love Christmas. Uh, Christmas is a wonderful season. Celebrating the Lord, His birth, sing all the songs that we love, you know, have the candlelight service. You know, it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful season. You know, watching all these movies and TV, 
and your family and friends that are coming to visit and you have your Christmas meal, and you exchange gifts, people send you cards, etc, etc, etc. Well, let me use the Christmas analogy a little bit so that we understand what grace is. Grace is a gift, therefore, as a gift, it cannot be a reward. Now, when, when Bob pays his employee, or any of you, if you could staff, pay your employees, it's not a gift, right? No matter how they look at it, it's not a gift. It is a reward for services rendered, right? You work 40 hours, you have an hourly rate if you're paid that way, and you can do the math, and do if you're smart at tie with a tax, you can do the deductions, and all of a sudden you come up with what you're going to get. But it's not a gift. And so when I was paying my staff, I was going to say, hey, I'm just, I just want to give you a gift. And we're going to give you that same gift every twice a month. We don't do that. Gifts are different. The gifts we give our kids at Christmas are not a reward for services rendered. We give our gifts to our kids because we love them and we appreciate them and we want to show our love to them. Now here's the thing, sometimes we give gifts to our kids when they're on the good list. So there's some incentive involved. Well, Johnny's been good for the year. And so, you know, I'm giving you this gift because you've been good. Well, God's grace doesn't look like that at all. Because here's the, here's the reality. When God gives his gift of grace, none of us are on the good list. We're all on the naughty list. So God gives his gifts to people who are evil, naughty people. Secondly, it's a gift, therefore it can't be demanded. How would you feel if one of your kids came up and just looked you straight in the eye Christmas time and said, hey, pull me up. Where are my gifts? Come on, give me the gifts. I want them now. I don't want to wait until December 25. I want my gift now. I demand my gift. Well, let me give you another analogy around Christmas. So Christmas mail comes in, you know, we trot it to the mailbox at the end of the street, pick up all that mail, and what, what will be there around Christmas time? Well, we'll have flyers, we'll have, you know, uh, people, we'll have the shopper thing that comes through, we'll have all of that, and then we'll have mail like Christmas cards and bills, right? So you get your... Energy bills, you know, rubber bills you still pay through the mail or get through the mail. You have, in the same box, you'll have bills and you'll have Christmas cards. So what's the difference? A Christmas card is a gift from somebody who likes you or loves you. A spontaneous gift just to say, thinking about you this Christmas. The bill you get from Midwest Energy or whoever it comes from, doesn't have nice flowery language on it to say, hey, you know, hope you're having a great week. Hope you've been careful out there in the snow and not falling down the hole, the hole, the hole. No, it just says you owe 275 bucks, and if you don't pay it by a certain time, then you'll be paying some more. It's called a demand. It's a demand for payment. Christmas cards are not the same. They're just statements of love and affection. And so that's grace. Grace is never a demand. It can't, it's different. Demands come from law, not grace. And we'll get to that probably next week. Third thing I wanted to say about grace is this. Grace is a gift that cannot be added to. One of the hardest things that people um, have to grasp with is the whole idea of, of grace being something that's freely given. We like to work our way into stuff. We like to pay as we go. And it's ingrained within most of us to do that. When the Protestant reformers came along, people like Martin Luther and John Calvin and these good folks, their emphasis was, on the basis of the book of Ephesians, 
that salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing, zero, such. Salvation is by grace, not through works, not by doing penance, not by doing this, not by doing that, not by good works. It's by grace, by the grace of God plus nothing. It's called sola gratia in the land. What they maintained is if we had any part of that at all, if there's anything that we did to, quote, deserve salvation, anything that we could give to that, it would actually nullify what the grace of God was. Remember, we define grace as God's unmerited favor. God's choosing to give grace to some people. So here's an example. Supposing you were found guilty of stealing, say, a thousand bucks. So you go to trial. You've been found guilty. You're going to be sentenced to five years in prison for your crime. But the judge cuts you some slack and says, in the courtroom, if you can come up with that thousand bucks today, I'm going to suspend the sentence. And so your family and your friends are in the courtroom. And so they go through their pockets and try to pull them. So all of a sudden, you know, your family members contribute 750 bucks, and then they pass the hat around the list of people in the, uh, the courtroom, and they come up with another $249.90. So you're now $999.90. You're 10 cents. You're a dime short. And the judge has to pass sentence because you're still short. But you rumble through your own pockets. And all of a sudden you come up with a dime. Give it to the judge, and it's now a thousand bucks, and you're free to go. There's two problems with this analogy. Number one, no matter how small the contribution that man might make to his own salvation, in man's mind, he's done something. He's done it. He's completed the action. And that nullifies grace. Because grace is all of God. And why is it all of God? Because God gives his grace for his glory. You follow? It's part of the glory of God to grant his grace that brings all the glory to him and none to man in the act of salvation. Paul says this in Ephesians. He says, for, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not the result of works, so that none of us can boast. That's why the grace of God is such a marvelous thing to talk about. And lastly, I want to mention this. Grace is a gift, therefore it's not an obligation. When we think about a sovereign God, it's amazing how many Christians that I've heard saying something like this, well, God has to, dot, dot, dot. God has to, dot, dot, dot. You know, whatever that has to is. There are some things that God does have to do. God is faithful to his word. He performs it. He stands over his word to perform it, like I said. God cannot be inconsistent with his own character. God can't ignore a man. The Bible says that he would lie. So he's consistent with his own character. But because God is a sovereign God, God's not obligated to do anything. God's actually not obligated to save a single soul. None of us, none of us can say, look at me, we I deserve grace. Because if we said that, God's response is, no you don't. What you do deserve is justice. Not fairness, it's a human concept, but justice. For all, the Bible says, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no exception. We're all in the same bucket. All in the same problem. Grace also means that God is free to save whoever he wills. Because God, by very definition, is a sovereign God, 
is not restricted to do anything that he doesn't want to do. That is totally different. When we think about ourselves in the society we live in, the words that we've mentioned before that come up all the time are deserve, demand, you know. Um, you know, I used to be involved in uh, labor uh, union and management negotiations years ago at Cummins Jesus. And I remember quite clearly when the shop stewards would come in, uh, the words that were used almost invariably were not, hey, if you, if you, if you, if you feel it in your heart to <laughs> give us a raise, that would be really nice. I've never heard a union guy ever say that. It's, what is it? Here are our demands. Here are our demands. Or, let's use another popular word. Here is what I believe I'm entitled to. So I have, we've got demands, we've got entitlement, we've got another one that's called, these are my rights. So now we've got demands, entitlement, rights and all that kind of stuff. You know all the time. Don't try that with God. God's not the government. Well, let me explain. The government, whether it's local, state, or federal, is elected by us, from us, right or wrong. We elect them. We put them in power. They are, or should be, accountable to us. They serve the people. The boss of the President of the United States is who? We the people, supposedly. But God's not the government. Nobody elected him. He wasn't put there by us. He's not, a, not accountable to us. We are accountable to him. As a free sovereign being, God does exactly as he wills. So if we want to talk entitlement, Romans 6.23 deals with our entitlement. And here's our entitlement, according to Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But it's a good job that the verse doesn't stop there. It's got that wonderful but. That conjunction that says, but the gift of God, the grace gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if something is a free gift, we can't claim it as an entitlement. Right? If it's absolutely free, it's not an entitlement. You see, the rights that we have as citizens are based upon the Constitution, are based upon law. So if you pay your taxes this year, as you should, you pay too much, by law you are deserving of, of what? A refund at some point, if you pay too much. But nobody has a right to a Christmas gift. Come back to the Christmas analogy. Because by better definition, it's a gift. Freely given. Rights belong to the world of law. But there are no rights in the world of grace at all. We can't demand it. We can't be owed it. The very idea is an oxymoron. Just can't live together in the same sentence. God's grace can't be earned and can't be deserved, and that's what's make, that what makes it grace. Jim Piker, J.I. Piker, said it this way. He said, what is grace? He says, in the New Testament, grace means God's love and action towards men who merited the opposite of love. Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners could not lift a finger to save themselves. 
Grace means God sending his only son to descend into hell on the cross so that we guilty ones might be reconciled to God and received into heaven. The Bible says, He that knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's why it's important for us to spend a lot of time to thoroughly understand the magnitude and magnificence of the grace of God. If there's anything in my ministry career and my Christian life that has continued to amaze me about God, it's His grace. That's why so many hymnologists, hymn writers, and songwriters have written songs like Amazing Grace, as we just Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord, songs about the grace of God. Because we'll be singing, I believe, with that grace for God. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be recipients of your grace. We thank you, Lord, there is nothing that we've done or nothing that we deserve to receive by grace. But we thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to be worthy of the grace we have received. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.